All right. Hello and welcome to this week's live Q&A session. So I'll uh, give everyone a moment to get all signed in and stuff. Uh, if you've already managed to sign in and you're watching on Zoom, then uh, just open up the chat box below and say a little hello, say where you are watching from. That'd be fantastic. And uh, as a slightly uh, exciting thing, uh, we are also joined by viewers on YouTube because uh, I uh, am doing a, a little kind of sneak peek for non-students. Um, so uh, you can say hello in the chat on YouTube and uh, I will, uh, I'll see who we got watching. All right, so let's see. We have got John from Sunken City, New Jersey. Uh, we've got Rob in Plymouth. We've got Edgar from the Netherlands. Uh, Nicholas from Pennsylvania. Uh, we've got uh, Deck from the West Midlands. Uh, let's see. Uh, who else do we have? Cynthia from Cornwall in the UK. Uh, who else? We have... Um, I've got uh, Mirko uh, from Italy. Um, we've got uh, Mike in Canada, Matty from Poland, uh, very cool. We've got uh, Vasily in Greece, uh, Michelle in Massachusetts, uh, Terry in London. We've got Chi Titania from India, Annika in Sweden. Uh, fabulous. Good to see everyone. Um, so the way this works is I have a guitar and uh, we start with uh, a little bit of a warm up jam. Um, so to make things easier, because uh, we've got a, a slightly uh, bigger group of people today, I'm, I'm going to tell you what key we're going to play. So I'm going to play in the key of G on the guitar. Uh, I'll type this in the chat as well so that you can you can see that. I'm just going to let some more people into the Zoom. And uh, yeah, let's uh, let's let's ask you a question. So if I'm playing in the key of G on the guitar, what key of harmonica might you grab um, to play? And uh, okay, a bonus bonus answer because I can already see people posting the correct. Well, not the correct. An option. What position are you going to be playing on that harmonica? So uh, let's, uh, let's see, let's see how, how well you know your keys and your positions. All right, so uh, John has got the right answer, but what, what position are we gonna be playing in? Yes, in second position, fantastic. And, and yeah, okay, so Deck has, has also proposed uh, F in third position, uh, which I think is a fantastic suggestion as well. Uh, all right. So I'm going to get started with a little bit of guitar. So grab whichever of those harmonicas you want to play. And if you're a little bit more advanced and you want to, to play in a, in a more advanced position, then please feel free to do that. Uh, but we're going to get, get warmed up. I've got my guitar here. Uh, we're just going to do a nice uh, shuffle. All right. Okay, we got the one chord.
right, awesome. Well, hopefully you are feeling uh, nicely warmed up. You all sound, sounded absolutely wonderful playing along. So uh, give yourselves a pat on the back. Uh, okay, so now, if this is your first ever Q&A session with me, uh, the way this works is I answer the questions that have been sent in in advance in the school forum, uh, and then I will answer questions that get posted in the chat uh, live. Um, so, Zoom chat or YouTube chat. Um, so, uh, let's see, I've just noticed that uh, Jeremy said that he's at work and thinks that playing harp in the office would be frowned upon. Uh, it, de it depends on what office. I mean, in, in my office, you would be invited to, to play as much harmonica as you wanted. Uh, I realize that I, I work in a slightly strange environment. Uh, okay, so let's have a look at uh, our first question. Um, which is from Graham. This is a great, great question, uh, which is about vibrato. Uh, so uh, Graham's asking, do you have any tips for vibrato on bent notes, like uh, Lick 3 of Advanced Intermediate Month 10? More specifically, perhaps, should the vibrato on a bent note pitch start at the bent note and go below or start above and bend down to? This is a, a fantastic question. So I'm gonna grab a C harmonica and talk you through uh, your two options. So let's imagine that um, I am uh, playing vibrato on a clean three draw, something like this. So there, when, when, I'm, when I'm, I'm starting on the clean three draw and my vibrato is pulling the pitch of the note down about a semitone and then releasing it back up to the clean note. So you could think that I'm playing a three draw half step bend, but I'm not. I'm playing a clean three draw with a vibrato that is about a half step. So that means the note is going down to that half step bend, but that's not my uh, point that I'm uh, vibratoing around. If you are playing vibrato on a bent note, that means that you're going to start on the bent note and then uh, release up and bend lower down. So you'd probably end up with uh, a note that goes between the clean note, if you were playing that three draw half step, and maybe the whole step bend. Uh, so that might be something like. So I started on a three draw half step, And the, the width of the, of the vibrato depends on how hard you're playing and what you're going for. You might want to have a, a slightly uh, softer vibrato or a deeper vibrato, which sounds a little bit too aggressive in my mind. Uh, so go to the bent note and then hit the hit the vibrato so do that uh, that tremolo pulse uh, and make sure that your tongue is nice and relaxed uh, to get the the vibrato uh, releasing the note and bending it deeper okay um so graham i hope that answers your question if you're playing a bent note, then you start at the bent note. Uh, you don't use the vibrato to get to the bent note. Um, okay, so let's see, we've got some uh, more people uh, joining. Uh, we've got Parahod Studio from Kazakhstan, very cool. Um, okay, so let's have a look at the next question. So this, this is a question that's, that's quite specific to uh, the school, uh, but Mike is asking, uh, hi Tomlin, I'm wondering if you have any plans to add to the um, school curriculum after the new advanced intermediate level and also if the Edinburgh workshop might be happening at some point. Uh, okay, so first, first question, uh, the advanced intermediate level. Um, so at the moment we've got a, a new new curriculum that's kind of coming out and will the final installment of it will be out uh, I think it's next month or the month after um, and then that's that's a full uh, advanced intermediate curriculum uh, so I have I have a few ideas for where to go after that um, I'm potentially going to do an advanced intermediate part two 
because uh, there's there was so much that I wanted to add to that curriculum. Or um, I might be doing some kind of more standalone courses still as part of the school, um, but but kind of outside of that um, practice guide curriculum. So um, the, these might be things that are kind of very specific on a certain type of playing. So I, I was chatting to uh, Sandy, uh, one of the other teachers, about uh, well, he, he was suggesting doing this a kind of a, a, a whole course on positional playing um, and and specifically third position playing. So that that would be something that would be outside of the advanced intermediate curriculum. In fact, it, it would actually be positional playing for all difficulty levels. Uh, so that that's uh, one option. Uh, not fully decided yet. I've got loads of ideas for lessons, um, but I haven't decided whether I continue it within the practice guide format uh, or if, if I do kind of smaller uh, modules. Uh, but there will be more stuff coming, uh, not in the immediate future from that, that side of things, uh, just because uh, newborn babies uh, make it quite difficult to film uh, course, course content, um, but, uh, but potentially next year. Um, aside from that, there's still going to be the, the live workshops every month, uh, from, uh, from the, the other teachers, um, so that there's always going to be new stuff to be working on. Um, so, uh, I, I don't think you'll get bored, Mike. Um, and then, yeah, the Edinburgh Harmonica workshop. So we were supposed to do one in 2020 and then something happened, which meant that we had to pull it. Um, and, uh, Basically, I, I want to do them again. I'm thinking that I'll start doing them again next year, 2023. Um, I'm in two minds as to what, what approach I take with the workshop. So in the past, the workshops have always been relatively large. Then they're, they're not completely insane and giant, but for me to run with my wife, uh, they're quite big, sort of 80 students uh, and four teachers and flying people in from all over the world. It's it's quite a lot to do. Um, so that that's how I've always run them in the past. I've been thinking about doing slightly smaller workshops uh, with just me or maybe me and another teacher with maybe 25, 30 students. So I'm, I'm just trying to decide what I'm going to do between those two. Um, and yeah, I'm really hoping to do something in 2023 and probably around May. Uh, so I'll, I'll announce it fairly soon once it's, uh, it's finalized. Um, so hopefully I'll, I'll see you here in, in Edinburgh, Mike. That would be fantastic. Uh, okay. Let's see. Um, right. So, um, I've just noticed a really good question uh, that's uh, come through on YouTube. Um, and I apologize if I don't manage to answer all the questions that come through on YouTube. Um, I, I think there are probably going to be quite a lot, but I'll, I'll do my best um, with, with the, the allotted time. So this will be an hour long Q&A. Uh, but Mike is asking, uh, pucker or tongue block when starting out? Uh, if starting with the pucker method, when do you transition to tongue block? Thanks in advance. Uh, so this, this is a great question. And um, I want to be really careful that I don't get misquoted on this. Uh, so I generally start students out with lip pursing, but that doesn't mean that that's the right way to do it. Um, there are other teachers who will start students out on tongue blocking. Uh, personally, I've had better success with more people um, starting out with lip pursing and then adding in tongue blocking later. That said, I have also had quite a few students who've come in and they've really struggled to get clean single notes at the beginning lip pursed and, uh, and, and they've found tongue blocking just feels a lot more natural. So they've started with tongue blocking and that's been fine. Um, so it's, it's really up, up to the student with, with the, the caveat that, you know, both are going to be difficult at the beginning. Uh, generally, for most people, lip pursing is easier to get started. Uh, in terms of adding in the tongue blocking, because I do think that adding in tongue blocking is, is really useful. Um, I, I think having both embouchures in your repertoire is fantastic. Um, generally, I so I, I add in tongue blocking in, for my intermediate students. So that's kind of year three of the curriculum. Um, 
and I st- get people started with uh, tongue lock octaves. <laughs> That kind of thing. So where you're playing uh, two notes that are separated by multiple holes. So I'm playing one blow and four blow. And I'm blocking holes two and three, so I'm not playing those notes. Uh, So that's kind of the first stage of tongue blocking for a lip purser. And then later in my advanced intermediate curriculum, I introduce uh, tongue blocking for single notes and for the um, various uh, textures that you can get with tongue blocking, because that's the, the big kind of plus side of adding tongue blocking into your playing. Um, uh, great question. And, and uh, yeah, I really want to reiterate, there is no right or wrong way. Um, do what feels natural to you. Uh, I think you'll find that um, there are advantages to both. And it's really useful to have both in your repertoire. And most really good players use a bit of both. Some players use just one or the other, but most a hybrid. Um, okay, so let's see. We have a question from uh, Lauren. Lauren has asked, um, <laughs> he said, hi, Tomlin. I'm sorry if this question is a bit too deep in the theory department. How does the relative minor apply to the harmonica? Uh, for the key of G major, the relative minor is E. Without going too deep with theory, does this mean that you're playing in fifth position? Um, okay, so Let's, let's have a, a very, very quick explanation of relative major uh, and relative minor and um, and then kind of talk about how it applies to harmonica. Um, so when you hear the terms relative major and relative minor, what that means is you have uh, a, a major scale. For ease of use, I'll talk about the C major scale. And you have its relative minor, which is all the same notes as the C major scale but with a different root note. So you're starting on, uh, for for C major, the relative minor is an A. So that means that in your C major scale, which has the notes C, D, E, F, G, A, B, you're going to play exactly the same notes, uh, but make sure that you start on the A. So you do A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then end on that A note. So, Major scale, minor scale, they'll have a, a very different feel uh, because of, of, of where you're playing, uh, because of where you're starting, what your root note is, what your home note is. So I'll just quickly play the C major scale. Okay, and then I'll play the A minor scale. So C major scale hopefully sounded a little bit more happy and uh, joyful, and the A minor scale hopefully sounded a little bit more sad and mel- melancholy. Okay, um, and that's that's basically the idea of relative major and relative minor. Now, because I was starting on a different root note, I was changing position. So when I was playing on my C major harmonica in the key of C, uh, I was playing in first position. When I switched to A uh, to A minor, I was playing in fourth position. And what Lauren asked is uh, if on the uh, C harmonica uh, we're playing uh, the relative minor of uh, your G major scale, uh, you're going to play the E minor, and that is actually fifth position. So our G would start on the two draw, and uh, our E would start on the two blow. So you're going to play the same notes. Uh, so if I play, uh, what I'll do is I'll play the major pentatonic scale uh, in in the key of G, uh, and and the reason I'm doing that, I'm going to be absolutely honest, is just because my five over blow is going to be a little bit um, a little bit weak uh, to play a full major scale. So I'll just I'll keep it simple, just with a major pentatonic. So major pentatonic, and I'll play those same notes, but starting on the two blow. Uh, so there we have the minor pentatonic scale, uh, just because I uh, switched it around. Um, 
<laughs> so Jeremy's saying uh, A minor sounds a lot less minor when immediately preceded by a C major scale. That's true. Uh, that you, you've you've got that kind of ear memory of of where you started. But if I now play uh, the A minor scale, having not played the C major scale for a while, it'll sound a lot more minor. So hopefully that sounded a little bit more minor. <laughs> um, so yeah, that that's kind of how the the relative minor stuff is going to relate uh, on harmonica. Um, and yeah, it's quite. I mean, what Jeremy just highlighted is quite interesting. That a, a lot of these scales and notes really sound different depending on what the context is. And the context is is massively dictated by your root note uh, and by what, what has been played before and after. Um, and if there's a chordal instrument underneath, that also makes a huge, uh, a huge difference. Uh, okay, excellent. So that's all the questions that were sent in advance. Uh, so please uh, feel free to post questions in the chat. And uh, I will uh, I will do my best to answer them. Uh, oh, I've just noticed uh, <laughs> T has just slipped one in uh, in the forum, so I'll answer that quickly. I'll have a, a slurp of coffee. Okay, so uh, Tomlin, the lick challenge has helped wonderfully to develop licks. Uh, I'm still improvising a solo, but still improvising a solo seems difficult. Uh, is it a good idea to fix a rhythmic pattern and build a solo? Um, how can you reconcile creating rhythm and improvising the licks? Thank you. Okay, this is a, a brilliant question. So just a little bit of context for people who uh, aren't doing my September challenge, which is uh, my September lick writing challenge. The premise is that I have provided uh, rhythms for licks, but I've not provided notes. Uh, and so your improvisation is only the note choice. Uh, so for example, uh, your rhythm could be something like, um, let, me, let me make sure that I'm just, that I'm playing one of the rhythms that I've actually provided. So I'll, st I'll do a really simple one. Uh, let me just open up my tab and play one of these. Okay, so first rhythm. Okay. Uh, so I'm, I'm playing a long held note for three beats, then I'm playing another beat, an, an, another quarter note on beat four, and then an eighth note on beat one of the next bar. So the rhythm has been set, but what you can do is choose whatever notes you want to play using that rhythm. So it could be... See what I mean? So the improvisation comes from the note choice. And this is just an exercise. This isn't how you improvise every single time. Uh, but what T is asking is, uh, you know, how, how do you start improvising your rhythms uh, and your note choice? And, and the thing is, you're going to practice all of these kinds of exercises where you're just practicing one element of your improvisation. So for now, that exercise, the only element you're uh, practicing is note choice. Rhythm has been dictated. Another thing that you can practice is your rhythmic improvisation by taking the note choice out of it. So you can say to yourself, okay, well, I'm only going to play uh, one note for, for argument's sake, the two draw, and that I'm going to improvise a rhythm around. And you can do that just completely unassisted, but if you're struggling to come up with rhythms just on the fly, a really good thing to do is to listen to other people's playing. And, excuse me, listen to uh, singers, listen to saxophonists, listen to any instrument you want, because you're not directly trying to copy exactly what they're doing. Uh, but you're trying to be inspired by it. Okay, so let's imagine. I said, come on, baby, don't you want to go? So uh, that's our rhythm. And then if I do it without the melody. And then I can play my own licks to that. 
So there, I'm not playing the the melody of what I heard. I'm just playing the rhythm of what I heard. I'm copying it. Um, and you do that enough in your practice sessions that when you're kind of taking the, uh, the leash off and uh, improvising, f- kind of letting it go, then all of that stuff that you've practiced will start coming in. But I, I think a lot of people misunderstand what improvisation is. They think that improvisation is just purely unbounded creation but it's not what you're doing is you're taking all of these things that you've learnt and you are recycling and changing and applying them to the scenario that you are in so that includes using all of the licks that you've learnt and making them fit what you're playing that includes using all the scales and note choices that you learn any rhythms that you've heard will um will inspire you and and you're bringing all of this knowledge into your improvisation. Uh, But that's overwhelming to think about at the beginning when you're first starting to learn to improvise, which is why breaking it down into simpler exercises like only choosing notes but not choosing rhythms or only choosing rhythms and not choosing notes uh, or playing a lick and saying to yourself, well, I'm going to play this lick, but I am going to change what note I end on. So if I play a lick like, okay, and I could play it with a different ending. Okay. So I'm, I'm improvising there, uh, but I, I've taken a lot of the choices out of my mind. Uh, I am only allowed to change the ending of the lick. Whereas if, if I'm thrown in and told I can just improvise and do whatever I want, that opens too many options to me. So keep it, keep it simple. Um, all right. I hope that that helps you, T, and anyone else who's struggling with uh, their improv. Uh, break it down into manageable chunks and build it up from there. Uh, all right. Let's see uh, some questions from uh, YouTube. And uh, people watching on Zoom, please, please post questions as well. Um, Okay, so Michelle has asked, any tips on getting reeds unstuck quickly while playing? Uh, I find that my reeds get stuck often when I'm tongue blocking. So this 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 is a really common issue, and um, you know what what's happening when you're uh, when you're playing and your reeds are getting stuck is that too much saliva is going into the instrument. And uh, the, the kind of the, the first thing that you need to do if you discover that your uh, harmonica has stuck reeds because of that is to have it facing down and tap it out, you know, against against your jeans or whatever, um, just to try and get all of the excess moisture out of uh, the reeds. And you might find that your reeds are still stuck, but at least they won't be uh, completely drowning in your saliva. And then you want to uh, kind of g- give it a little bit of a, a play and and maybe just try and shift some of the air, just kind of breathing in and out through the instrument. Uh, and, and and really see if you can work those reeds. So that... Though, that's kind of all I've got in terms of ways of quickly getting the uh, reeds unstuck on the fly. And I've definitely been in that scenario. Um, it often happens in the heat of the moment on stage uh, when you're maybe playing a little bit more uh, aggressively and, um, and and maybe not thinking about having as, as good a technique as you might do in, in the practice room. So th- this is what I, I would probably want to address in this scenario, which is kind of what you can do to stop it happening in the first place. So there there are a few things to think about. The first one is if you're relatively new to playing harmonica or you're relatively new to tongue blocking, you know, both of those are are, are kind of valid, then you're going to salivate a lot more 
than uh, you will do in the future. And that's normal. It's your mouth and your tongue uh, not being used to the positions and the, the foreign object in your mouth. So it's just going to start creating extra saliva. So that will go away with more playing. Uh, it's not even a question of practicing not salivating. It's just, you know, your body will learn that it doesn't need to produce tons and tons and tons of saliva. So that's, that's the first thing to think about. The next thing to think about is uh, making sure that you're in a good position to stop saliva from really over collecting in the harmonica. If you're facing down like this, and you're playing down like this, then gravity is going to just push the saliva down into the harmonica and it's going to get blocked. So what you want to make sure is that you're, you've got nice uh, uh, upright position, good posture, and the harmonica is tilted up so that even though you're salivating, it's, it's not going to pour up into the harmonica. Instead of... There, any juice that's coming out of me is just going to collect and pool in the harmonica. So think about your position. Um, and then think about your, your uh, kind of... Um, your breaks that you're taking while you're playing, micro breaks. Uh, so what, what I find is that a, a lot of this kind of over salivation and reeds getting stuck will happen when you're kind of playing without taking any pauses whatsoever. So if you're doing something like... And you do that over and over and over and over and over without stopping, then you're not giving yourself any moment to uh, swallow the saliva. Uh, whereas if you, you, you take a, a break every once in a while, even if it's just, just a micro, micro pause. Every time I, I have the harmonica out of my mouth just for a split second, I'm swallowing. And that's getting rid of the excess saliva. So think about that. And then finally, think about your harmonica setup. If this is happening all the time and you've thought about all of the other things I mentioned, then your harmonica reeds might just be gapped a little bit too close together. Um, and uh, this is something that I find quite often if people have been uh, setting up their harmonicas to play perfectly when they're practicing, uh, they quite often set the reeds to be quite, quite tight um, with a, a, a small reed gap, which might make your overblowing easier. It might mean that you can play really gently. Uh, the problem is, is that as soon as you play the harmonica in anger uh, on stage uh, or you know, in, in any kind of stressful scenario, uh, you're going to play harder and the reeds are going to choke. So you might want to have a bit more of a compromise of the uh, position of the reeds uh, and not have them gapped quite so tightly. Um, so, Michelle, I hope that answers your question a little bit. Um, and uh, yeah, you're not alone. It's a very, uh, very uh, common issue and we've definitely all, all faced it. Okay, so let's see. We've got a question from Eric. I'll have more coffee and then I will read the question. Uh, okay, so this is, a, this is a great question. Eric's saying, I'm working on the advanced beginner coursework. Uh, it seems to me that you introduce bent notes into the licks and warm-ups before teaching how to successfully bend them. An example would be the one draw bend in the scale in the warm-ups. Is it useful to continue to do the scales if I can't hit the one or two draw bend? Yes. Um, so the, the, the scales are, are such a fantastic tool to practice your technique. And part of your technique is being able to hit the bends. Um, so for example, right now, um, I've, I've not been playing a lot of harmonica recently. Um, most of you will know, but uh, we've just had a second baby. Um, so I've been in baby mode for the last couple of months, uh, which has been delightful and wonderful and, and great, but harmonica has suffered a little bit. And that's totally fine. But what I've noticed is that my uh, my bending. Well, I, I was I was playing on uh, on this D harmonica uh, yesterday, doing some practice, 
and I, w- I noticed while I was playing my scales, because I still practice my scales, uh, that my three draw whole step bend just left quite a lot to be desired. Uh, so I was playing the major pentatonic scale. And that three draw just wasn't right. Um, and it's, it's, still not, it's still not as smooth as I want it to be. Uh, so I have just been focusing on that because uh, I discovered it playing the scale. So now my process is instead of playing the scale, I'm just playing uh, a very small portion of it so I can practice getting into that bend and out of it uh, smoothly. And really trying to refine that. And then when I'm comfortable with that again, I'll start playing the full scale. So think of your scales uh, on a kind of first point as almost a diagnostics tool. So when you're trying to play the uh, the adv- like the blue the extended blue scale that I teach in uh, Advanced Beginner, which is uh, holes one to six. If you're if you're thinking, well, I can't play that one draw half step bend, then uh, think about isolating it and then bringing it back into the scale gradually. So that one draw half step bend is the same note as the four draw half step bend, an octave lower. So it's a very similar bending position, but because it's an octave lower, you're going to have to tune your vocal cavity to be bigger than it was for the four draw half step bend. Okay, so think about the you know the the note the pitch that you're trying to hear being very closely related to the four draw bend, but further back in your mouth. So that's going to take some training from a, a kind of uh, strength point of view, being able to open up that vocal cavity deeper uh, towards the back of your throat. So think about jumping between those. Four draw bend, sorry, four draw, four draw bend, four blow, and then doing the same an octave lower. One draw, one draw bend, one blow. And what you might find is that if you if you just do exactly the same thing that you did on the four draw on the one hole, you're not gonna get very much. See there, I didn't really bend the note very deep, but that's because I'm I'm doing uh, the uh, vocal cavity shape that I wanted for the four draw bend. And I'm trying that on the one hole and the one hole's just saying, well, that's not enough. That's not enough uh, change of uh, pressure to get that bend. So there you're gonna take that starting point because it's not a bad starting point and add more pressure. (sighs) Pull your tongue a little bit further back. Okay. And then when that, that feels comfortable, you can come back into the scale. And then you might hit that two draw whole step bend and it's not deep enough. So there you can work on that in a similar fashion. Um, yeah, so that, that's, that's what, what I would, I would uh, suggest to Eric. Um, the two draw whole step bend is really important to get nailed before you get to that point in the curriculum. So uh, I would work on that separately. Um, and, and I think that will make your one draw half step bend super easy if if you nail that two draw whole step bend. Um, and yeah, you can use the scale, but also use um, riffs uh, and melodies that you know well, things like uh, Sunshine of Your Love. Uh, or Low Rider. I think Low Rider is what made my two draw whole step bend work. Uh, so. So it's that that note uh, and just just hitting it over and over and over and over. Uh, so that was really really helpful. Um, okay, so let's have a look. Uh, Ananda has asked, "Can we get this video later?" Uh, yes, you will have a link for uh, the replay so you can watch it uh, later. Um, Steve's asking what key I'm in. So right now I'm playing a C harmonica and I was playing in second position in the key of G. Uh, All right. 
Uh, let's see if there are more questions. Sorry, I'm just scrolling up through there. There's been lots of lots of stuff typed uh, on YouTube. And please don't forget if you have any questions on Zoom to type that in. Um, okay, so Jim's asking, uh, my recordings on my PC sound tinny. Is there a better way to record? Um, so it's, qu it's quite a big question, but I'll give you a kind of brief overview of what you might want to do and think about. Uh, so there are two things to think about. One of them is, is, is how you're recording on the computer. And the other one is, is how you're playing. Um, because there, there isn't uh, a kind of fix that, you know, you can record things a certain way uh, to make them sound perfect. Um, and I, I'm not suggesting that um, you're sounding tinny when you play normally, but that, that is something to think about. Uh, so what you want is a setup that recreates exactly what you're doing acoustically uh, and then that will give you an idea of, of how you sound acoustically and what you can improve. So to record well on a PC you probably want uh, an external microphone of some description and uh, and some kind of way of plugging that microphone into your computer. So the absolute simplest option is to get something called a USB microphone uh, and kind of good options. There's uh, something called the Rode. Uh, I think it's NT-USB. That's a pretty good option for plugging straight into your computer. Uh, and you know, th this, this is kind of your, your first step into home recording. This is not super pro. It's not insanely expensive, but it's a great place to, to get started. Um, then a, the next level up from there would be having a microphone uh, and something called a sound card. Uh, now, a sound card, let's see if I can show you one. It's, uh, <laughs> it's cabled in too tightly underneath my desk. But basically, it's a box that plugs into your computer with a USB cable or whatever uh, kind of connections you have. And then you plug the microphone into the box and it converts your signal to something that the computer can record. And uh, all of these things you're going to want to record into some recording software, uh, something called a DAW, that's a digital audio workstation, I think. I think that's what it stands for. Um, if you're an Apple user, then uh, you'll probably want to start with something called GarageBand. If you are a Windows user, then I would suggest using something called Audacity. Audacity is free, uh, open source. It's a great place to start. Um, but yeah, you'll want a microphone that plugs into a sound card, into your computer, into your recording software. And uh, the kind of microphone that, that you'd, you'd want to get is uh, probably something dead simple to start with, um, is just a vocal microphone. What I would recommend is something called a Shure SM58 uh, or an SM57. It's kind of the industry standard for vocalists. Um, and that'll give you a pretty good uh, representation of what your harmonica sounds like uh, acoustically. Now, the way to kind of make sure that you're getting that, that nice warm sound when you're recording is making sure, uh, for starters, that you're using your hands correctly and kind of channeling the, uh, the sound towards the microphone. Because uh, if, if I play kind of over here, not going to sound as full as if I do. Uh, whereas I do that, where I'm facing the microphone and I'm using my hands to direct the airflow forwards. Um, so that's quite an important one. A, lo a lot of the tone is going to come from your hands. So if you just played like this versus Uh, you'll hear a difference in, in the kind of the thickness of the tone. Um, 
so yeah, those are some things to think about. Uh, the easiest thing is is getting a, a, a USB microphone and something like the Rode NT-USB is a great place to start uh, if you if you want to make your recordings sound better. Uh, but you know you will you will go further. <laughs> uh, I, I, I guarantee you, if you get started looking at home recording stuff, it is a rabbit hole. Uh, it's a very fun rabbit hole. But uh, you'll you'll kind of look up and think, wow, how did I acquire all this equipment, and why did I why did I get so much stuff? Um, but uh, yeah, it's fun. Okay, let's see what other questions we've got. Um, Okay, let's. Okay, so uh, Mark's. Sorry, I'm, I'm trying to see where Mark's question starts. Uh, okay, Mark has said, uh, I've been working on playing blues with 12 bar jam tracks for a while, second position. Now I'd like to play accompaniment with a single guitar player on various pop and country songs, such as Ventura Highway, Margaritaville, Country Roads, etc. I'd like to stick to second position since I'm most familiar with this. I'm thinking I need to get the guitar chords for these songs and then play mostly the tonic notes in a rhythm or licks. Is this the best or only approach to sounding good on these songs or is there something easier or do I need to play in first position? What approach should I take? So this this is, uh, <laughs> that's an amazing question. Uh, and I think that it's, it's a problem that loads of people face, uh, especially if you've been learning blues. Um, especially if you're one of my students, because literally all I play is blues. Um, and, and then, you know, you, you start thinking about playing other genres of music and it's not exactly the same. And uh, don't worry, I can, I can show you some tricks because uh, cause I'm, I'm quite good at faking other genres. Um, and and I've, uh, I've done this a lot because not everyone wants to listen to you play blues all the time. Uh, I used to play in wedding bands. I used to play in covers bands. And we didn't end up playing as much blues as I would want to play. So you would kind of come up with some ways to improvise and support the, over the song that... Uh, mean that you don't always have to know what the chord progression is. Uh, so the, the, the kind of the really great thing about blues is that we generally stick to one chord progression and that makes it very easy to communicate with other uh, musicians what's going on and it makes it very easy for you to uh, play over and you know outline the chord changes. If you're playing over a song that you don't know the chord changes to, the most important thing is to know what key you're playing in, okay? And uh, then to know whether it is major or minor. So let's, uh, well, let, let's try this out with, um, with country roads. Uh, so what I might do is I'm, I'm gonna grab, I'm gonna do this very, very low budget. I'm gonna go and grab my phone and put YouTube on and we'll listen to Country Roads and I'll tell you what key it is and I'll show you how I'd approach playing it. Give me two secs. I love it. Jeremy has, has asked whether there are uh, other genres of music. I mean, look, Jeremy, I, I've, I've been told there are other genres of music. I thought there was just uh, just blues, but um, apparently there are other genres. Uh, let's see. Was it was it Country Roads? that? Well, yeah, it was. Let's have a look. Country Roads. So I'm assuming it's John... Okay, so my first step is listening to it, working out what key it is. Okay, so fir first stage, I've worked out that it's in the key of A major. Uh, which is great because that means that I can play uh, on my D harmonica in second position, which is what Mark wanted to do. And immediately, because it's it's a kind of 
folky country uh, sort of acoustic sound. Uh, I will probably want to play major pentatonic licks if I can, uh, because it's in the key of, of A major, I can do that. Okay, so there I'm not following the chord changes. I'm literally just using my major pentatonic scale uh, and trying to, I'm, I'm playing too much because I'm playing over the singer quite a lot, but you get the idea. That scale provides me with the note choices that are gonna work in that scenario. Two draw, three draw whole step bend, three draw, four draw, five blow, six blow. Uh, that's quite a kind of safe place to start. And you can extend that scale up an octave. And it's great because there are no bends in the, in the upper octave. So that's six blow, six draw, seven draw, eight draw, eight blow, nine blow. I can also come down one draw and two blow, you can add those in. So you've got, got a nice wide range on the harmonica. So you'll still be playing in second position and it'll fit really well. Now, the thing to be wary of, which I think you probably know this already, Mark, otherwise you wouldn't be asking this question, is you know, if, if you're playing over a genre of music that isn't blues, don't play blues licks over it. Uh, and there are certain things to avoid. So if I put Country Roads on and then I start playing some bluesy stuff. You know, it, it works musically, but it doesn't work uh, aesthetically. Um, so think about that. Don't, don't play, well, avoid the four draw bend in a non-blues context unless you know that it's going to sound good because that's, that's a very powerful blues statement. Uh, and then be, be wary of, of other kind of blues harmonica sounds that might not fit uh, over the scenario. Um, and then if, if you find out that the, the song you're playing over is a minor song rather than a major song, um, then you can't use the major pentatonic scale, but you can use the uh, minor pentatonic scale. So let's, uh, let's, let's kind of try, let's demonstrate that. I can't think of any songs right now that are minor, so I'll just I'll make something up on the guitar. Um, just a, a quick minor chord progression. Okay, so how do we know that that is minor? So if I play that, it's my two draw, so I know that I'm in the right key. And now to work out whether it's major or minor, I play the three draw, clean three draw. And hopefully you can hear that that clean three draw sounds awful. But if I bend it down to the half step, it sounds good. So there I'm gonna use my minor pentatonic scale. And that is uh, two draw, three draw half step bend, four blow, four draw, five draw, six blow. And if you can play the blues scale, you can already play the minor pentatonic scale because the blues scale is built from the minor pentatonic scale with the addition of the four draw half step bend. So all you have to do is take out that four draw half step bend, which if you remember a minute or so ago, I said, take that note out because it's too bluesy. And then you have a, a minor scale that works in most scenarios. So there you can just play over that chord progression uh, with the, with the uh, minor scale in second position on your D harmonica, so A minor and that'll work really well. Um, so hopefully 
mark that gets you started with a couple of tricks um and yeah if you know the chord progression you can start playing the tonic notes that's not a that's not a bad thing um but uh if you don't know the chord progression then those scales are the place to start uh i hope that helps um Let's see, I've just noticed a birthday. So JP's saying, uh, can you say happy birthday to my wife? It's her birthday. Uh, well, happy birthday. And uh, I'm gonna do something which strikes terror in my heart. Uh... <laughs> I apologize for the, the, the wobbly rendition. It's one of those things that I never think about knowing it. And then someone says it's their birthday. And I think, ah, I got to play it. So that's a, a slight ear rendition, um, maybe slightly bluesied. Um, but uh, JP, I hope your wife has a fabulous birthday in New Mexico. And I hope that you're treating her well and uh, not spending too much time um, watching harmonica YouTube people. <laughs> uh, all right, so, so let's see. Uh, we've probably got time for a couple more questions. Um, so uh, Adioni82 uh, said, hi, I'm new to harmonica. Thanks very much for the invite. How do you do that vibrato without using hands? Um, so let's, let's just really quickly, um, <laughs> Steve saying I could have done a, a happy birthday more accurately. You're absolutely right. I really could. And I apologize. Um, I will, I'll work it up for next time. Um, so yeah, hand vibrato and vibrato vibrato. Um, we need to be careful about our definitions just for starters. Uh, so and if you say the word vibrato and many people will contradict me on this, uh, but this, this is the hill that I'm going to die on. I'm happy to die on. If you're saying the word vibrato, then it means that you're changing the pitch of the note up and down. So anything that you do with your hands is not actually vibrato. So anything like that kind of thing or is not vibrato. Uh, this is a, a hand flutter or a hand tremolo, you sometimes hear it called. Uh, and all that means is that you are changing the amplitude uh, or the tone of your note with your hands. Similarly with the, the hand wah, That is, uh, that is just a change of the tone, not the pitch. The vibrato changes the pitch. So if, if you want to get that kind of uh, effect with your mouth, you can do either tremolo with your mouth or you can do uh, vibrato or you can articulate depending on what you're uh, trying to achieve. So if you want to get that kind of flutter, you can approximate it with a so that's a tremolo, uh, which basically I'm playing a note and then I'm saying ah, ah, ah on an in-breath. So I'm going And if I wanted to change the pitch of it, I would bend that note down. Still with the vibrato, but I'm adding a bend to it. Sorry, still with the tremolo, but with an added bend, which turns it into uh, vibrato. And then if you want to get the kind of hand wah kind of effect, uh, you can do a, a kind of uh, inflection on it. So I'm, I'm saying wah wah when I play. So my, my tongue is bending and releasing the note up and down uh, as if I was vocalizing through the harmonica. So it's not exactly the same, but you can kind of, um, you can kind of approximate it. 
so I, I hope that that helps you, uh, Adion, uh, and I hope that I'm pronouncing your your name correctly. Um, Jeremy's saying uh, Fender screwed it up when they named it the Tremolo Bar. You're absolutely right. It drives me absolutely nuts. Um, it's uh, it's a vibrato. It should be a vibrato bar. I'm happy with whammy bar. Uh, I think that that that's okay. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, <laughs> that annoys me. Uh, okay, let's. Uh, well, I think that's pretty much us out of time. That is six o'clock. Um, so thank you so very much for joining me, uh, and. Uh, well, students at the school, uh, thank you for uh, letting us have some extra guests today. That's uh, good of you. And um, I will, well, I won't see you next week, but you'll be getting uh, a session with, uh, who is it? Oh, well, we don't have one next week. We've got one the week after with Todd. Um, and uh, then it will be, uh, I think, Todd and then Robert. And Anyway, you will get... Uh, mostly weekly Q and A's just because we have five Thursdays in September, there isn't a, a fourth, uh, a Q and A on week four. Uh, and then everyone else, I will uh, hopefully see you around soon, uh, maybe in school, certainly on YouTube. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. And uh, yeah, I will, uh, I will see you next time. All right, take it easy and happy harping. <laughs>